Hello everyone, Victor Tanzig here, and welcome to the Reddit Railway. Today's destination is r slash pro revenge, so all aboard! Before I met my now husband, he was married to a woman named Denise. Their marriage wasn't one of love, but financial benefit. He was in college, but she couldn't afford to go because her father made too much money to qualify for a loan. They got married to get around this. My husband, Harry, worked in commercial real estate and went to school part-time. With his income plus some grants they both got from the college, Denise was able to go to school full-time. After graduating, they stayed together for a bit. Although they didn't really love each other, they did like each other. In 2000, my husband started to feel like their time together had passed its prime. She agreed. Now, I need to mention they both had cars with leases on them. Part of the divorce was he would pay the remainder of hers. They were amicably divorced 90 days later and were both dating their future spouses a few months later. This was when I met him. A year and a half after the divorce, I moved in with Harry and Denise married her extremely well-off boyfriend. A few months later, my husband decided he wanted to change jobs. The position he was eyeing would start him off on a significantly lower salary but would grow into something more substantial. However, this meant we would basically be living on my income for at least a year which would barely cover the bills, not to mention the car payments for him, Denise, and me. My car was on its last legs and I desperately need a new one. Harry decided that since Denise was remarried, he shouldn't have to continue paying for her car and that he should take it back. Both were in his name. I would then be able to drive it instead of buying a new one. We consulted a lawyer who said the car would likely be considered alimony even though it wasn't written in the divorce decree. The court would likely see it that way so there was a good chance Harry would win if it went that far. Harry called Denise to explain the situation and asked to take the car back. She said no and ended the conversation. He called her a week later and asked again, stating that if she refused, he would take her to court. She said she had spoken to her husband and they weren't going to give the car back. With no other choice, we went to court. The next day, our lawyer filed the complaint. A few days later, Denise received the summons. She called Harry, saying she and her husband wanted to come over and see if they could work something out. In short, we didn't, but she seemed confident she would win, saying, I talked to a lawyer, and he doesn't think you have a snowball's chance in hell of winning in court. Harry replied, Okay, have a good night. Bye. Harry shows up at the courthouse, but Denise doesn't. The judge reads the complaint, listens to Harry's story, and rules in his favor. Once Harry received a printed version of the complaint, he hatched a plan. He called Denise and told her he won the case. He asked for the keys. She said no and hung up on him. He then went to the dealership to order two new keys. He knew where she worked and what her schedule was. He ordered a tow truck and requested a sheriff's officer accompany him to her work. They locate the car and load it onto the flatbed. They move the tow truck to the curb right outside the doors of Denise's job. She comes walking out and freezes at the sight before her. She says, you can't take that. Harry hands her the judgment with the officer saying that what they're doing is perfectly legal. She continues, but I talked to Joe. He said you didn't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning. Those were Joe's exact words, snowball's chance in hell. It took Harry a moment before he remembered who Joe was. Our mortgage broker? Your lawyer is a mortgage broker? Yeah, he said it wasn't written into the divorce decree as alimony, so you couldn't take it just because I got married. Well, you should have told that to the judge. He may or may not have agreed with you and Joe, but since you never showed up to court, we'll never know. She was left gobsmacked. They get back to our house and unload the car. The driver of the tow truck is laughing his ass off. He ended up discounting the tow. I sold my old car within a week and I took over the payments for Denise's. We got married, had a kid, and lived happily ever after. And the moral of the story is, pay your own way every chance you can, and always show up for court. Oh, and also make sure your lawyer is actually a lawyer. This revenge story happened in the 90s when I was working after school as a line cook at a Chinese restaurant. The place specialized in noodle soups, with the main attraction being our soup stock. The owner used an age-old family recipe. It consisted of freshly cracked pork bones, spices, and vegetables, all kept at a rolling boil for over 12 hours. It had to be started the night before, and the owner was very particular about it. If it ran out, then it ran out. He refused to cheat, as some places do, by adding water or powdered stock. The owner himself was this really awesome old Chinese gentleman. He had some incredible stories. For example, he served as a cook in the Chinese Republic Army during World War II. He told us at the time he used a push bike to escape the Japanese army 
after they had overrun his division's headquarters. When the Communist Party took over China in the 50s, he was assigned to a steel factory where he was expected to work for the rest of his life. Instead, he got out of China and made his way to the US as an asylum seeker. He was a genuinely kind and considerate boss. He always made sure his employees were fed before the evening shift and let me study during quiet hours. Anyway, I digress. My point is, he was awesome. His son, on the other hand, was a real piece of shit. This guy dropped out of college after two years. He floated between jobs, but mostly stayed unemployed, living with his parents and using their money well into his mid-30s. He eventually started working at the restaurant as the front of house manager, but in reality, he did nothing but watch TV and take naps. The old man and I got along really well. In fact, he showed me how to make the soup stock. Five years after I started there, he tragically died. That's when the son took over. His mother had passed away years ago. The son had zero cooking experience, but decided to take over as head chef. He didn't like the idea of putting the soup on overnight, saying it was a waste of gas. Instead, he had me do the prep work the night before, and then he would switch the pot on himself in the morning. He would also routinely add plain water to the soup when it got low, so he could continue selling noodle soup. And, most disturbingly, he got the wait staff to throw a customer's unfinished soup back into the pot for reuse. When I confronted him about it, he told me it was all right as the heat killed any germs. He then threatened to fire me if I said anything. Unsurprisingly, customers started leaving as the food quality degraded. This caused the son to panic and cut even more costs. He fired most of the old staff and overworked the remaining ones. He couldn't fire me because I was the only one left who knew how to make the soup stock. He also stopped using quality ingredients and started to buy cheap, pre-packaged stuff in order to reduce my prep work hours. After a few months of this, I decided to quit. He of course took this poorly and told me that I was a loser. He told me not to bother coming in tomorrow, but I was to spend the remainder of my shift showing a newly hired cook how to do my job. He said he wouldn't issue my last check if I didn't do this. I laughed in his face and walked out on the spot. I did didn't bother chasing up my last check. As a parting gift, I sent an email to our local food safety board about him reusing leftover soups. I also enclosed a few photos that I had sneakily taken of this. The board sent inspectors the very next day and closed the restaurant. There were other issues such as unhygienic bathrooms, unclean eating utensils, etc. He was issued a massive fine and a list of corrections he had to make before the place could reopen, which it never did. I didn't bother chasing up what happened to the son, but I hope he has learned his lesson and did something productive with his life. This story struck a chord. I've mentioned it several times in the past, but my first job was working in a restaurant, so I learned the importance of keeping things clean, especially Especially when it comes to food. So for the sun to reuse soup like that? Ugh, that's disgusting. And bullshit to any germs being killed off by the heat of the pot. There are a million ways a person can get food poisoning. I'm glad the place got shut down. It's just too bad the old man's legacy was spoiled by his incompetent son. And with that, I'll end the video here. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good one.